Um, hello, everyone. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to the new professionals webinar. So today we'll be discussing our chosen project for the year, um, which is digitization and how it affects whose stories we tell. As part of this, we are launching a survey where the link will be available at the end, looking into digitization strategies within organizations and the communities these affect. We're very lucky to have some experts working in this area joining us. Joanna Smith and Sean Smith from Canada, Jessica Holland from the UK, and Angela Schilling, who I'd just like to say an extra thank you to for staying up until 1 a.m. in the morning. We chose a picnic blanket as we wanted a more informal chat with our wonderful guests today, rather than a round table. Plus, the weather here in the UK is finally getting a bit better, so it is perfect times for picnics. Later in the webinar, we will have a brief time for questions, so please do send them through. Um, and to start off, everyone is going to introduce themselves, starting with Elizabeth. Hello, everybody. My name is Elisabeth Klintford, and I'm based in Germany. I studied archival science and information science at the University of Applied Sciences in Potsdam in Germany. And currently, I work for the State Archives of Baden-Württemberg. I work on a research project um, on the application of OCR and other machine learning technologies in the archives. So the goal of my work is to make archival records more searchable, to make them more accessible. Um, but I think digitization is not only a technical issue, it's also a, a social and an ethical issue. And I'm happy to talk about this side of digitization today. And now I hand over to Francesca. Um, so my name is Francesca and I'm a digital archivist at the National Archives in the UK. My main responsibilities include file format analysis for the tools Pronom and Droid that my team manage and I also ingest collections from different government departments, um, though the work in our team is very varied. Um, during my archive masters I discovered an interest in coding and digital archiving and I really wish that digital preservation could be more accessible within the archival community. One of my interests is archives and accessibility. And prior to my role, I took a research position looking at crowdsourcing and community involvement um, and how that could help train handwritten text recognition software in archives. And it also involved running a game jam. Um, uh, I've also worked in a variety of different archives, including a botanical archive that had collections from explorers all around the world. And I'm very excited to be part of the new professionals and be working on this project. I will now hand you over to the next. Sorry, it's my turn. My name is Luz Maria Narbona. I am Chilean. I have been an archivist since 2017. I have worked on various archival projects in Chile related to the modernization of archive and scientific and socio-environmental history. Now I am working on the personal archive of a woman archaeologist. Also, I am part of Archivists Without Borders Chile and of Chilean Archivist Assembly. Through my active participation in the first one, I seek to contribute uh, to the visibility of the relevance and value of the archive outside the traditional stance, academic and cultural, to bring them closer to the community, social organization and individuals. I am very happy to be here and to listen to you discuss this very interesting topic. For me, digitalization is a topic that has many aspects and I think it is important to problematize it. I think that digitalization is fundamental because it promotes access and democratize information, but I also think it is important to pay attention to its complexity and the gaps that it also generates, which is why this webinar is so important. Thank you. Greetings from the capital city of South Africa, Pretoria. My name is Makutla Mujapilo, and I'm currently working as a lecturer in the Department of Information Science at the University of South Africa. Our institution, UNISA, is an open distance and learning institution. So we offer teaching and learning uh, visually through an open distance. So we rely mostly on 
the, the application of information and communication technologies to support our students. So part of my work at UNISA includes teaching and learning. So we give support to our students, we do the assessment, we develop tutorial letters, we develop the study materials, and uh, some of the modules that I'm responsible for include uh, uh, archival legislations, uh, digital data curation, and I'm also responsible for record, I mean, teaching records classification systems. So in terms of my career, I've had an opportunity to work at the National Archives of South Africa as an archivist. And then I also had the opportunity to work at uh, South African Human Rights Commission as a records manager. So I've now uh, decided to move to academic in uh, 2019. That is why I'm currently uh, based at UNISA. So now I'm no longer in practice, I'm now an academic. So I'm currently studying towards the PhD in information science and my research topic is the implementation of freedom of information uh, legislation in South Africa and Zimbabwe. So uh, I welcome you to come and participate in this important topic today. It's going to be a very, very interesting engagement and as uh, Francesca has already indicated that we've got guest speakers who are very knowledgeable in this uh, area. So thank you so much. Hi, I'm Zoe Dickinson. I am one of the new professionals, but unfortunately I'm not able to be there with you today. I am originally from the UK. I have UK and Irish citizenship but I'm currently living in the United States. I'm currently working at the International Monetary Fund as an archives and records officer in Washington, DC. And prior to that, I was working in other international organizations in Europe. I worked at the European Central Bank in Frankfurt and the International Atomic Energy Agency in Vienna. Um, I graduated from the University of Glasgow in 2016 with a master's degree in information management and preservation. And as part of the degree, we had to conduct a placement. Um, I'm pretty sure usually most people tend to stay in the UK for their placement, but I wanted to do something a little bit further afield and managed to organize something with the National Archives of Malta. And that was my first experience of being able to work in archives abroad. Um, I have always had a huge love for history and for travel and I pretty much so working in international organizations, getting to travel and then working in archives is a way of putting both of those two things together that I love. I'm also a member of the ICA section for international organizations, which is just a really great way to connect and network with people that work in similar organizations to me, but from all over the world. Uh, I attended the meeting a couple of months ago, which obviously was virtual this time, um, but I also attended in person um, in 2019, which took place in Brussels. I have a real interest in what this survey and webinar is about. Um, I am really interested in records of marginalized groups, um, how we share those records and make sure that they're available to people, and my two specific interests are records relating to gender, for all genders, and records relating to the LGBTQ plus community. I'm sorry again that I can't be there, but I hope you have a fabulous time. I cannot wait to hear all the feedback and get all your responses to the survey. So thank you so much. Sorry. Hi, my name is Razan. Um, uh, I am um, one of I am one of the of the new professionals uh, this year. I'm very happy to have this opportunity. Um, I have a baccalaureate degree in uh, conservation restoration management, and uh, I am enrolled. Uh, in in master degree in information library information science this year, um, I was the archival technician 
for ACOR, uh, American Center of Research. Um, I'm very happy to be with you this, this, this day and this webinar. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for, for watching us. Thank you. And now I think we're going to ask our guests if they wouldn't mind introducing themselves. Okay, I guess that's me. Um, my name is Sean Smith. I'm a senior archivist at the Archives of Ontario. We are a settler archives located in Toronto. Our building is situated on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe. The land on which we're, situ we're situated has been the subject of many uh, agreements among Indigenous people to mutually steward and share resources in the Great Lakes region. And it is also governed by Treaty 13, or the Toronto Purchase between the Canadian government and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Many diverse First Nations, Métis and Inuit continue to call this land home, and many are represented in the collections at the Archives of Ontario. It is our commitment at the Archives to bring Indigenous voices into all of our programming. We're the second largest archives in Canada and the largest provincial archives. Uh, we have a lot of stuff, suffice to say, uh, but we don't have everything. And over the last three to five years, we really get begun to explore the question, whose stories do we tell? As a large institution, we cannot assume that every person or community will come to us, nor can we assume that every story will be found among our holdings. So we understand that it is our responsibility to reach out and support memory work wherever it is, wherever it is happening in the province. Our dedication to community engagement has really uh, generated a paradigm shift in our thinking. Uh, paradigm shift that includes uh, placing relationship over custodianship with a focus on developing and strengthening long-term relationships with many communities rather than the acquisition of records, uh, taking the perspective that not one size fits all. So we aim to learn the unique organizational structures and archival needs of various communities and groups who wish to serve and adjust our approach and activities accordingly. And also understanding that outreach begins at home. Uh, so we have a responsibility to identify what relevant materials are already in our collection and what ways we can make them more publicly accessible in collaboration with communities. And if done properly in the spirit of service and collaboration, we feel that digitization and digital access can be fundamental tools for furthering much of this work. Thank you. Hi, okay. Um, so my name is Jessica Holland and I'm a digital archivist and curator. I, I'm currently the manager of knowledge production and pedagogy at the Arab Studies Institute in Washington, DC. But I'm going to speak uh, today to my time as archivist at the American Center of Research, or ACOR, as um, my former colleague Razan uh, just mentioned. So Razan and I worked on the ACOR Digital Photo Archive project. And the initial aim of this project was to provide resources for US academics and cultural heritage professionals who are working um, or doing research on threats to cultural heritage in the region, uh, such as the destruction of Palmyra by ISIS. However, in the process of doing this digitization work um, of 30,000 images, we realized there were many, many other groups that would also be interested in these images. So we sought to change the project slightly in order to be able to serve those groups. So we made two major changes. The first one was related to language. So um, the original project was designed to be just describing the images in English and that work being done by American, uh, North American, I should say, um, MILS uh, graduates. So we changed that slightly because our team was actually um, quite a lot more diverse and we introduced descriptive metadata in Arabic, not for every record, but where we could do so within the scope of the project. And this was really well received by local schools and universities who started to use the resource uh, in their classrooms. And as a result of this change, the second iteration, so the second round of funding for the project had um, a, a condition that the, the materials would be described completely bilingually in Arabic and in English. And this is really important in the post-colonial context of Jordan, um, even though it was an American center of research that was uh, carrying out this project, it's uh, specifically important within that, that community. Um, and the second thing that we did was to establish a digitization uh, internship program so that we could also be sharing those archival skills with um, with uh, young professionals coming up in the region. And in the future, um, it would be 
uh, smart to do something like what is in place in Canada, and perhaps one of the other panelists may speak to this more, um, but to devise a system somewhat similar or inspired by the traditional knowledge licensing um, that exists, which would be appropriate perhaps for the Bedouin communities within Jordan, which are heavily represented within the archive. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Angela Schilling, and I'm a manuscripts archivist at IATSIS, which is the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, we are located on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country, which is also known as Canberra in Australia. And uh, I'm also uh, an, an ICANU professional uh, alumni from 2019-2020. So it's really special to be here tonight um, or today with everybody. Um, so IATSIS deals solely with marginalised records um, by and about Indigenous communities of Australia. So um, for us, there's no question of whether we choose to digitise these records above those that are um, or white or non-marginalised. However, IATSIS was established in the 1960s as a repository for white researchers to study um, what they thought was a dying race. So um, there's lots of issues for us when it comes to our legacy and the trust that or the lack of trust that communities have with us. Um, we need to think about the reasons that we digitise and our values in doing so. And we also think about metadata, data so sovereignty and our priorities when we digitise. Um, we're located in Canberra, which is Australia's capital. Um, it's not a very accessible place. Um, it's hard to get to, it's expensive. Um, so it's it is very hard for indigenous communities to get to get here to access their records. Therefore, digitization is a very powerful tool that we use to connect people with their families and their records. Um, something I feel is most important when it comes to all archival work is slow archives. So meaning taking the time for self reflection um, and fully understanding how we as archivists and um, information professionals hold power when it comes to making marginalized records accessible. Um, further than just knowing the language of decolonization. So this includes how and why we digitize. Um, IATSIS and specifically the digitization team actually look to a concept called um, Yin Yamara, which is a Wiradjuri word. So that Wiradjuri is a country um, in the southeast of Australia. Um, it doesn't really have an English translation, but is the, close, the closest is respect. So respect for one another, for country, for culture, for language and for information. So, yeah, and um, when we understand this concept fully and it takes a lot of time for us non-Indigenous people, we can think about how to hand back knowledge and information that belongs to our um, Indigenous and marginalised communities. There, can you hear me now? Thanks for organizing us today, um, new professionals. It's great to be here to talk to you. I'm Joanna. I work at Library and Archives Canada. Um, that's the National Library and National Archives for Canada, located here in Ottawa, which is um, uh, situated on unceded Algonquin territory, which means that this land doesn't form part of any treaty or agreement with Indigenous people, um, the settler community built um, built here, and that's where our city is, is founded. Um, digitization at LAC has been going on for about 20 years. We have a, you can imagine, a very large collection. Um, we've tried to calculate how much of it is digitized. And you can imagine that's a tricky <laughs> number to come up with to devise a formula. I can talk about that more later if you like. Um, but we we uh, estimate we have approximately 3% of our collection that's been digitized. So it's a, it's a big fun problem to figure out how to make as much material accessible as possible on our website, particularly because um, Canada is so big that we can't necessarily expect everybody to come to one location to do research. So that's sort of one driver for digitization. Um, our budgets and, and 
and staff that we have dedicated to digitization are never big enough to do everything we want to do. So we do our digitization in four main ways. And I think I can show you how the diversity question um, comes into play in each of them. So the first is establishing internal priorities where we feed the digitization teams. Um, here we try to look at what are the most popular collections? Where do we think that researchers may want to access into the collection where we can make it available online? So we looked at what clients have used most often, um, but as you can imagine, it mostly is feeding our known clientele and known collections. It doesn't necessarily bring to light collections that nobody knows about other than the archivists. So we sometimes need to go um, a little deeper. Um, that being said, and our collections are of vast interest to marginalized groups who have suffered harm at the hands of government. So that um, client interest has meant that we've digitized deeply into collections related to Indigenous people, um, related to Japanese Canadians and Chinese Canadians, for in instance, who seek to look at our collections to right the wrongs that have been um, um, put on them. Um, secondly, we work with partnerships. So we work very uh, closely with genealogy partners. As you can imagine, genealogy is a big part of our clientele and genealogy companies are very interested in helping us digitize material. Um, also, we partner with universities and that's where we get a more diverse range of collections interest. Um, an example over the past few years has been with the University of Victoria, um, who have a research project that focuses on the experience of Japanese Canadians. Um, so they have been very interested in, in the records that we had already scanned, but that we didn't have very detailed metadata about. Digitization being, of course, the scanning and as much indexing and description that we can capture. So we worked really closely with them to index um, carefully those descriptions. And the additional piece that comes from partnerships that's really helpful is something Sean alluded to, which which is the connection to the community. So that academic project is much closer and connected to um, interest groups of Japanese Canadians. And they in some ways become an intermediary between us as an institution and directly with the community. And then we partner with them in those communications as well. So, so that's a very interesting um, path for us as well through partnerships. Third, um, we have client-driven digitization. So people request um, things to be digitized and provided to them in digital form. We're not able to always put those things right up on our website because of the way our descriptions work and needing to link into descriptions, um, but we try our best. And we've also recently created a DigiLab where um, researchers can come in and do all the digitization and metadata creation themselves and that material on our equipment. And that material we can then repurpose and package on our website for everybody. So that's where we're getting closer to the interest of Canadians, the interest of research groups potentially focusing on um, margin groups can come in and use equipment and partner with us to get material digitized. Um, the last way we digitize is when we have federal funding for specific projects um, to serve the government priorities. So we did a lot of digitization of military records in the commemoration of the First World War. And currently we've been digitizing materials related to Canada's Indigenous people. This has been um, an amazing way to get material identified. So researching into our collections, we hired Indigenous archivists to come and work and do the research to scan the material and to create culturally sensitive descriptions. The way materials were described in the past was not always appropriate or meaningful for um, the groups that they're about. So we've done a lot of improvement in that area. Um, and also through that project and funding, we were able to create a grant program where we could give funding to Indigenous communities. So not necessarily um, acquiring materials into the national collection, but supporting Indigenous communities to digitize, preserve and make accessible those materials themselves. So it's really shifted the way we think about the, the Canadian heritage as a whole and working with others to preserve and make it accessible, not having it all centralized here in Ottawa. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to our guest for such a wonderful introduction. It looks like we're going to have a very robust and uh, engaging kind of a session. Uh, so now we've got to uh, the second part of our uh, webinar, 
which is uh, the questions and answers. So we'll be asking questions to our uh, guest in the house, and then they will respond to our questions. So now, when once we are done with the question and answer session, we will also check comments from our uh, social media. As you will know now, we are live on our social media platform. So we'll get some few questions just for five minutes uh, to respond to our, our, our colleagues at home, friends and families and professionals at home. So, so uh, I will start with the first question. And once I'm, I'm, I've asked uh, and we got response, I will then hand over to my other colleagues who will uh, go on with the questions. And, and, you know, I'm so glad that you've uh, mentioned the issue of marginalization, which uh, it, it, it's, uh, it has, it, in fact, it's occupying the center stage of our, our engagements today. And it looks like we've got people who have got diverse knowledge in the area of digitization. And, you know, I'm so humbled and pleased to, to be with you today. So I'm going to start with the, the question. And, I'm not directing the question to anyone, so any anyone can simply respond to the question. I just want to find out if your uh, your organization digitize uh, records, and I I also want to find out if you've got uh, some challenges when coming to the issue of digitization. Anyone who will want to uh, answer the question. Does your organization digitize the records? And what are the challenges that you are facing uh, when coming to the issue of digitization? Anyone on the floor? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, of course, we, we digitize records. Uh, right now, of course, we're all living through a pandemic and uh, we're, not, uh, we're not anywhere near our collection per se. Um, but uh, during the course of our regular activities, we're digitizing every day. So either mo mostly uh, in response to customer uh, inquiries and, and needs, um, but also to support our, our outreach and educational programming, our exhibits, um, and any other activities that, uh, that we're involved in that, that is that front facing part to, to reach out to, to communities. Um, I think the big challenge with digitization, and, and I don't mean to downplay the, uh, anybody who digitizes records, but that's the easy part. It's more what you do with them. Um, the question, can we digitize records, is simple. Yes, we can, but should we? That's, I think, where more of the interesting sort of uh, uh, conversations come in. Um, you know, I think one thing we pride ourselves on in archives is context. Records often are nestled, nestled within a particular context that allows an individual to understand sort of um, the, what the record's about and, and what it supports in terms of its overall thinking process. How do you do that in, in making it available online? Um, there are certain places where context can be can be recreated. Exhibits, for example, where, where multiple voices can be brought into to, to the exhibit. Um, but if you're putting uh, images out there into the Wikimedia Commons, which we are, um, there's the potential for a single image to go astray and, and lose all of its context. Um, so I think these are some of the things to, to think about. And, and, it's, and as I said, it's not the question of can we, but it's a question of should we. Thank you. Thank you, Sid, for your answer. Uh... Anyone, my colleagues, new professionals who wants to ask the question? I would like to ask a question. So I already hear you are all very engaged in, dig in digitization and digitizing records related to marginalized groups. I wonder um, how people can access your records. Um, do you have a database online or do you have additional services how people can engage with your records? And um, if you tell us about these services, maybe um, I would be also interested in how do people respond to your services? Do they use them? Do, you, do they find them? Um, how is your experience with this? I can answer that if, if you like, Elizabeth. 
I think all of us probably can. <laughs> yes, please, Joanna, go on. Um, I think, yeah, I think uh, the we've um, like like we've talked about the the issues of digitization or, or the the project of digitization is not just about scanning; it's also about cr creating a way for people to search, right? Because Google is not going to bring up an image unless you type in the word um, "TP West Coast." That's not a thing that would come up. <laughs> TP Plains Plains Indigenous Peoples. Then you may get images if the image had been indexed that way. So that indexing portion of the project is really important. I think, you know, one of the challenges when Makutla you asked is really the backend infrastructure on how do we match the image, the description, the link to the archive multi hierarchical archival description, and when we're talking about vast numbers of items, we have of almost 200 million images that we're trying to make accessible on our website and, and adding to all the time. So it's definitely um, a challenge in terms of the technical piece. In, but but gives us an opportunity for what you just talked about in terms of connecting with Canadians and researchers. Um, so one way is we've tried to do that is through our DigiLab where we have people um, can interact with the physical material and scan it. Not right now because of the pandemic, <laughs> we're closed for that, that service right now, but in general. Um, but the other way is through the creation and correction of the metadata that may be on the records. So there we have um, a piece on our website called CoLab. Um, so normally material is made accessible on our website through our main collection search. You search for a term, a digital image comes up, um, or you can scroll through images that may be attached to a file. Um, and CoLab is an add-on piece to that database that allows anybody to add descriptive metadata to the image. So they can um, add tags of visuals that they may not have, that may not have been described. They can add people's names if they can identify people in there. They can add um, information in different languages. We would love to be able to present Indigenous language on material. There are many Indigenous languages in Canada. Um, so that is another challenge that uses very many diacritics, but it's something Thing we're working towards to be able to allow um, translation, transcription, and tagging in multiple languages. But we've noticed it's really a way that people like to, A, they like to participate because it's a little addictive, but B, you get people who are really experts, far more expertise than any of the archivists have, that can dig in and give a lot of detail on the materials that, that we just couldn't do. So it's a great, it's been a great way to connect with communities on specific projects and, and in general creating those challenges. Thank you, Joanna, for your response. Uh, any other question on the floor? Francesca, Luz, Razan, do you want to ask a question? Oh, I, I want to ask, you've been talking about all these amazing initiatives and the sort of goals of your institution and how you really want to reach out to different communities. And I was wondering how well that's gone and whether you want to do more and how it's going with the communities um, themselves and what you'd like to see in the future. Um, I can answer that if you like, or have a go. Um, I think that, so, I mean, yeah, there's, we um, digitised for a few reasons, for access, for, for clients, um, for preservation and for community repatriation of materials. Um, reaching out to a community is, and working with them to, um, to, to, act, to best, you know, give access to their records how they would like access to their records is what we would like to do and we are only just starting to do it it's a really really slow process and I think um, it's a little bit scary I think for a lot of the non-indigenous archivists um, for the indigenous archivists who are best placed to work with community it's a really big burden because we don't we're not um, most of our staff are not Indigenous. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of finding the balance or keep keeping the conversation up about how we go about it. We used to be a very small institution um, who were mainly researchers 
um, linguists, anthropologists, filmmakers who also did the archiving. We didn't have, we weren't a collecting institution. So as you can imagine, we have a lot of, um, you know, things to look, our legacy materials to go back and look at again. Um, but the connection, as, as soon as we became a collecting institution, those connections to community were lost. The, the, the connections were with the linguists and the people that worked in community for 30 or 40 years. So um, those connections aren't really there anymore. We have to rebuild them and rebuild them. And it, like I said, it takes a long time. And I think it's a big burden on the Indigenous people that work with us. And so it's slow, um, but we just, we want to do more. Yeah. Um, if maybe I can respond to the same question uh, following on, is that okay? Thank you, Thanks. Jessica. Thank you. Thank Go you. on. <laughs> Uh, so, um, ACOR, the American Center of Research in, in Amman and Jordan, uh, is also a, like a fairly small institution um, and perhaps somewhat similar um, to your institution, Angela. It uh, was for most of its history, it's been sort of archaeology focused, so the archives that have been left uh, or that have sort of been inherited as part of um, the institution tended to be kind of scholars' archives with the associated photographs and also um, sort of paper-based documents documenting excavations. Uh, so one of the first steps that we did as archivists or as library professionals coming in was to try and make those connections with um, the existing archival and library community of practice within Jordan in general and then slightly regionally as well as almost a first step to kind of get uh, make people aware of the resource so our collections that are digitized are online on like a dedicated website um, and to sort of have a space where we could share knowledge, share approaches, share challenges, and at the same time, kind of communicate a message of openness and of willingness to engage and to be wrong and to uh, learn from each other and learn from the approaches that were working, perhaps for the National Archive or um, other institutions. Um, and then secondly, the language, of course, is quite a, an important factor. Um, it sounds sort of uh, silly almost, but I guess because this project was the first look at a large digitization project that brought a lot more scrutiny to the archive rather than the previous 30 years when everything had been in boxes and not really disturbed, it perhaps was the process of having people in the room drawing attention to these images, getting people talking about it, that then brought those questions up of why on earth are we doing this all in English only? <laughs> Of course, it's useful for the US researchers, but in, in the, the second phase of the project that I mentioned, we again were applying to the US government for our funding. But one of the key ways that we managed to have the, um, the compulsory bilingual metadata description in there was to, uh, to talk about the educational benefits uh, to Arabic language teaching for um, US students as well. They could use this tool in English and in Arabic and get their practice in. So I think once you started doing that thinking of, okay, there's a problem, how do we approach that problem? Then you can do the slightly creative thinking of how do we how do we continue with similar funding sources so we don't change the whole system uh, overnight, but we can make the gains that are important. I think the other factor is um, connecting to the community as you're planning the project. So. Um, Angela, you sort of talked about having some Aboriginal Indigenous people on staff and and that we've experienced the same thing where all of a sudden that person is not doing their job anymore. They've become the spokesperson for all the Indigenous people in the country as we try to develop the project. So we realized that that was creating a really un asked for and, and in some cases unfair burden on those staff people um, as we started to think through at least our Indigenous projects more recently we developed an Indigenous advisory circle where we brought together experts um, from across the country who could speak for their communities could speak for their um, their expertise outside of our institution and really have them develop the project with us. Um, we also hired seven archivists in Indigenous communities who supported our work on the grant program and on identifying materials in collection and, and speaking to it. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's really like trying to get, get out of our traditional way of setting up a project and what we think is best and just be open to it. And, and you said something else too, which is true. It, it takes a lot of guts to say, 
we're a we're going to do this in partnership with indigenous people or b we're going to let indigenous people be in charge of how these collections are researched and accessed and managed and prioritized and that's a big leap for um for for um, a settler institution and particularly a government institution to do but it's i think it's really important in terms of the perspective that that the project ends up ends up taking I think I think that in part uh, starts to answer the question: Whose stories do we tell? It, we don't have to assume that we're responsible for telling every story, or we're so great that we can tell we we can we know the story, the answer to all the questions, and we can tell the stories for everybody. But it's really that that attitude of service. Like, who, who are we? We are in service of the people who live in our case in Ontario, all the people that live in Ontario, and and what can we do to support? all the little story storytelling that's going on, all the memory work that's happening elsewhere. We're not the best at, at, at what we do. In fact, we've probably made tons of mistakes and we know we've made tons of mistakes over the course of our history. Uh, but how can we shift our perspective to being more, um, more in line with a, 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 an attitude of, of service and collaboration as opposed to assuming, as I said, we're the ones to tell, to tell everybody's stories. Um, just before we get get going here, we have been digitizing for a long time too, and, and most of our digitized records appear in our visual database, which is a very niche kind of instrument. Uh, probably you need to know how to use it before you can actually access the material. And I think for a long time, we've been unconsciously digitizing material without really thinking about what we're putting in there. But over the course of the last year, uh, since we haven't had access to our collection and we haven't been digitizing uh, that much, if at all, uh, we've really figured out, uh, we started to explore using the Wikimedia Commons and GlamWiki to really get our stuff out there in a way that we haven't before. Um, so I think putting stuff out, taking it out of our visual database, examining the metadata has raised all kinds of questions, especially as we move to uh, big time, which, you know, which Wik Wikipedia is. Um, and, and that certainly has raised issues around wow, we've had these racist images in our collection for all this time and they've been available. Why have we never noticed that? What are we gonna do about it? Are we, uh, are we actually going to be contributing to knowledge and understanding by posting them uh, in, in the Wikimedia Commons or are we gonna be causing harm? Who can we ask about that? Can we figure out a way that puts the, the images up in a safe, in a safe way where, where there are um, you know, content warnings, for example? Uh, can we communicate why we're doing this so that people understand the reason why this material is out there or are these images best best left uh, removed from from uh, you know public public knowledge uh, a racist image that you're just putting up for the sake of putting it up can cause more harm than otherwise it can also con it can contribute to, to knowledge and understanding but at the same time i think these are the things that we we need to think through and come to terms with before we move forward and making stuff more widely available Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Sin. Any other I question a, on the floor? Yes, I I have a question with with uh, that's connected with uh, what you just said. Um, in some cases, you might have archival records which are already described, which have been described a long time ago, and maybe with hum humiliating language. Um, it's connected to this question. Should everything be online available um, what would you say how can we deal with this um, should we try to describe those records again is it too much work to do this do we have the capacity um, to do this or what can we do about this problem um, I can continue with, uh, with uh, answering that question that's okay um, in our case, I think uh, our approach is that we have to come to terms with the past, past practices, past descriptions, past work, and what can we do to improve upon our descriptions while at the same time sort of um, maintaining sort of a sense of what was of the historical context in which stuff was, was described in the past. So we, we, over the last year, have developed a description policy. Um, it has a number of principles that sort of uh, address how we deal with this, this type of material. A lot of it will involve, uh, you know, doing redescriptions of material to uh, uh, incorporate uh, traditional knowledge, traditional names, um, to better identify individuals, to recenter the focus of the description so that they're not white-centered, but they might be other-centered. Um, 
and really just sort of uh, doing a better job at what we should have been doing all along. Um, with digitization, I think one thing to remember is it doesn't always have to go in one direction. But uh, again, with our description policy, we, we put in uh, a take, we're creating a takedown policy as well. So that if we go forward digitization and it is done improperly or, or in a way that causes harm, uh, then we are open to reconsidering what we've done and to, to reverse, uh, reverse uh, that and take down the images. Um, so it's it's uh, it's work. It's work that we're we're willing to continue uh, evolving with and 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 looking at and hopefully, as I said, moving forward in a way that's respectful and uh, can contribute as opposed to causing harm. Thank you, Sin. Uh, is there any other question I can ask? Can if I? No question. Oh, thank you, Joanna. You can go on. Awesome. I was just going to add on um, because we've done a similar um, set of thinking, especially when we embarked on the Indigenous digitization work that we've done. We discovered it wasn't necessarily the, um, the archives or the library professionals who had applied problematic language to items, although that can happen. It was the original creators. So in most cases where we're finding offensive and racist terms, it comes from a government official or a photographer who has captioned a photo or given a file title that's inappropriate, or they're, they're simply using the language of the time, which was, was racist in describing people. Um, so we've put a rider or a, a, an explanation overarching on our website that says, you know, these records are created in their time in a particular historical context that is um, it can be racist or culturally inappropriate. Um, and then we've put specific trigger warnings on records that could be um, offensive. Uh, if it's if it's personally offensive about an individual, then we would we would take down or. Or respond to a takedown. The, the terminology in specific cases, we decided to leave the original problematic language, um, but deprivilege it by taking it out of the formal title in the description um, and putting it in square brackets and replacing it with appropriate language. So we really wanted to not white, not to remove that trace of of um, of the, the racism because that's a true part of our past, but correct it and warn as much as possible that it is considered by us to be inappropriate um, at the same time. But it, it involves a lot of discussion, as Sean says, to figure out that balance of, you know, how, how to correct versus erase. Thank you. You're Thank nodding. So so you have uh, similar policies in your institution? Sorry, uh, I didn't hear. Did you say Angela or, or Jessica? I, I didn't. I didn't catch that. <laughs> I, I saw. I saw you nodding, Jessica. Sorry, I, I saw. I thought you maybe have similar um, processes or thoughts about this in your institution. <laughs> Yes, well, so I was actually thinking about um, a somewhat related but slightly different uh, challenge. So we have had um, uh, a similar process of um, maintaining some of the language that has been applied by the creator, but, but changing the order in the metadata. Um, but a more, perhaps a, a more unique case to the, to the Arab region that we came across was that occasionally there'll be photographs of people from the 1980s um, when uh, so it may have been less common for, for um, the women to, to wear the hijab or to, to wear the, the face covering the head, or the head covering, uh, rather. And, um, and then there's some instances where the academics that were recognisable by, by library staff, for example, had then um, uh, started wearing uh, the hijab later in life. So we came across this sort of dilemma of where the responsibility stood with the archive um, in terms of whether to share images online, where we, we knew that perhaps later in life that person had changed their approach to images of themselves with their hair visible. So 
that uh, was something we we didn't we ha hadn't resolved yet, and it, it does bring about uh, a lot of challenges. I think for photographic archives, particularly where you don't know the identity of a lot of the people in the images. I think where you obviously with the academic we did know, we were able to, to speak to them and clarify what what they preferred to happen. But much more broadly speaking, and particularly with um, some of the Bedouin, some of the like tra traveller uh, type communities or communities settled in areas such as Petra. Um, it may be, it will take a lot of work to identify people in the images and then perhaps apply certain um, restrictions to certain types of material that could be perhaps seen by certain people. Uh, I know an archive based in Abu Dhabi, for example, uh, they had a private collection that um, the, the family would like to have processed by a woman archivist only and it could be kept as a reference collection but for women to access only. So uh, yes, so I was just thinking about how this discussion was um, reminding me of, of similar challenges and, and many of these things aren't necessarily resolved simply or immediately. Thank you, Johanna. Uh, unfortunately, we've got limited time. We are now left with about um, three minutes. And we also want to give chance to um, the, the public to ask any question. But before we go that, I mean, before we, 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 we give the public chance to ask a question, maybe I can ask the last question and uh, you can just be brief uh, in your response to the question. Um, there is a there is an assumption that you know as archivists, uh, you know what we we digitize uh, have got an impact on the kind of the stories or the the stories that we we want to tell, and uh, uh, it, it 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 also have an impact on the narrative that we choose to promote uh, through the digitization. So, uh, seen when you were doing the, the introduction, you mentioned the issue of collaboration and even in response to some of the questions you mentioned, the issue of collaborations with the public. Would you say, um, and I'm not referring this question directly to you, I'm, I'm asking to everybody, would you say that collaboration can go a long way in terms of minimizing or neutralizing uh, this narrative that uh, the, 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 the digitization uh, has got an impact on the stories that we, we choose to tell. Would you say that uh, the, pub, the, the, the collaboration can, you know, in a way make, uh, I mean, uh, um, bring the voice of the community to the archives through digitization? Uh, yes. Uh, I think so. But as, as, as I said, I think it has to be done in a spirit of collaboration and sort of a, a spirit of, of, of sharing. Uh, so I, I think the example that I can use is, again, with we have uh, a collection. It's the Alvin McCurdy Fall. It's one of the probably the, the most important collections uh, for understanding Black histories in Canada. It's very well used. It's, it's found its way into a number of academic papers as well as as well as art projects. Um, but it hasn't been accessible for quite some time just by the, by the mere fact that uh, our building is closed. And so one of the first projects that we undertook uh, with the GlamWiki uh, work that we did was uploading uh, already digitized images from that collection to, to the, the commons. So what that does effectively is now we're, we're, we're giving the images away freely. They're accessible to a number of, number of communities. Uh, we've been able to follow up as a result of that uh, with uh, partners across the province so that we know that it, this is a shared resource and now it's it's equally accessible to a number of people. Um, and in the short term, what we've seen by going in that direction is uh, we've already witnessed the material showing up in at least uh, one art gallery as part of a part of a, a pretty important project. Um, it's already uh, brought attention to, uh, from CC UNESCO asking us to sort of nominate the collection to uh, the Canada Memory of the World project. Um, and as well, it's, it's got us in touch with the people in, in the United States as well who are interested in working with us on a number of other projects that involve digitization of other collections. Uh, so I think, especially in this time where, where people don't have access to primary source material, 
uh, putting stuff out there in a way that gives of it gives it freely and will be picked up by a large number of people. I think uh, has uh, has the opportunity for for greatly benefiting community understanding, and for uh, in creating creating uh, you know breaking down barriers and, and increasing trust between a large institution such as us and an underrepresented community. Thank you so much, Sin, for your uh, quick response. Can, can we quickly jump to uh, our social media and see if we've got questions from the public? Uh, the first question, whose stories, whose stories do you think are represented in digitization project? Whose stories end up getting told and why? This is question from Anthea. Would you like to respond to the question? Anyone from the floor? There's, there's, there's a long answer and a short answer to that one, Anthea. I think you've cut to the quick of our profession. I mean, it starts with who, what are we collecting? How are we building these collections? Then what do we choose to digitize amongst the 3% you know, that we've digitized in the collection? And then how do we describe it and make it available? So there's, you know, we think we, we attempt to be um, objective and all these things, but there are layers of interpretation that happen. What I can tell you is when we asked our Indigenous advisory circle what to call our digitization project, they chose the name we are here sharing stories. It was really important to them to use the we language um, to position Indigenous people as being at the heart of that project. Um, and because of the way we conducted it, I think we're closer to doing that. But but certainly the that what we've digitized is not the truth of the Indigenous experience in Canada. It's very government focused. It's got a bias. You know, we always have to acknowledge that in our in, in the records that we hold, it's there to start with, let alone in how we digitize. It's a great question. Thank yeah. you so much. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's let's take the second question, so that we give other people chance to ask questions. If we can take about three from the public, we'll be fine. Uh, the second question from Mata: Can Sin mention the name of the art project he mentioned? Sin, would you like to respond? Yeah, it's uh, by an artist named Diana Bowen, uh, and it's currently staged at the Kitchener and Waterloo Art Gallery. I think I think it might have just been taken down. Unfortunately, I think it, it probably didn't get as much um, um, airtime as it probably could have. Uh, I'm just gonna look it up for you. Uh, oh, it's called the uh, Black Drones in the Hive, I think. Um, but uh, if you search for Deanna Bowen, you'll find lots of interesting things that she has done with archives. Uh, may, many of her, like a lot of her work with the M.O. Hammond Fall is uh, informed a lot of what we did with posting that material into the Glam Wiki space. Um, but yeah, with the, the Black Drones in the Hive, uh, there, was, uh, there was at least one image that came from uh, the, the McCurdy Fall uh, as a centerpiece of that collection, or as that, of that exhibit. Uh, thank you for quick response and we, we have run out of time. I thought, okay, let's just take the last one, the last question. Do you think as archivists we should revisit our fonts and reinterpret them to include different perspectives? Um, I can answer that. Um, I'll do it quickly, but I think the answer is yes, definitely. You know, we know now um, that the forefathers of archival thinking and tradition are not, um, you know, what we base our practice on anymore and our theory. So I think definitely, yes, um, parallel provenance and looking back um, and holding space for those in the uh, records that we that weren't mentioned the first time, the the speakers and the singers and all the other communities that are represented um, need to be there. So yeah, that's the answer, I think. Thank you, Angela, for quick response. Uh, 
Unfortunately, we have got to the end of the session and I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who participated in this webinar, uh, studying with our special guests and, and also special thanks to Angela for being up up until this time. I know it's, it's uh, probably two o'clock in the morning in, in your country and we really appreciate that. And we are also inviting the public to participate in the survey that will be distributed uh, across all our social media platform. Please, uh, uh, you know, uh, participate in the survey and share it with anyone that you know. As Fr uh, Francesca has indicated that we are launching uh, our, our survey. And thank you very much. Uh, the information is on the screen and the link will be shared with you. And once again, we really appreciate your time. Thank you. Goodbye.